Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, the author of Stiff and Spooked. Um, she is sort of perhaps the pinnacle in a sort of semi-series that I seem to have put together this fall unknowingly on general creepiness. Um, <laughs> a, a couple weeks ago we had Neil Gaiman in who talked about very creepy and strange things indeed and now Mary and in uh, December the former Surgeon General is going to come in and talk about the healthcare mess that we've put together in the United States which you know is pretty creepy and strange as well. Um, Mary has done research over the past couple of years on what happens during death, what happens perhaps right before we die, what happens right after we die. All after. All after. Um, and has gone around the country and just talked to some really, really fascinating people. And uh, I hope you very much enjoy this. Please help me welcome Mary Roach. Thank you. I, I only make that distinction just because I, I get um, a lot of people saying, wow, so you're, you're sort of really obsessed with death. <laughs> and I actually, um, I, this current book is kind of not death. It's, you know, people researching life after death. And the one before was uh, actually about cadavers and medical research and all the bizarre post-mortem careers that uh, <clears throat> they've uh, ended up in. So um, I'm leaving the death thing to Joan Didion and, and, and others. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I'm really very actually pleased to be back in the Northwest. I've been out in New England, uh, which is beautiful, but I, I, don't, I don't get the feeling New England understands me. Um, I, I went to some small bookstores where I, I believe the staff was actually frightened. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure I entirely understand New England. Uh, I, I, Unless I'm hallucinating, I was staying at a hotel whose guest amenities included a falconry school. I was, lo I was just looking, I was looking through the room service, uh, looking for the room service menu, you know, trying to get a hamburger, and I found myself reading about the Harris hawk, a, sp a species known for its amiability. I mean, this is, is this not a, bur a creature that swoops down on bunnies, tears them to pieces with its talons? I mean, I don't Perhaps there's some pleasantries exchanged first. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, we are not here to talk about raptors. Uh, uh, we are here to talk about mankind's greatest mystery, uh, life after death. Um, isn't it great that I've solved the mystery, me, <laughs> Mary Roach, with my BA in humanities? <laughs> I've figured it all out. Uh, I've been finding that that's actually uh, what some readers expected of this book. I've got a reader review in Elle magazine that said, I know no more about the afterlife than I did before I picked up this book. <laughs> I think she actually thought that I would have gone there and come back with photographs and soil samples and a souvenir snow globe, maybe. <laughs> Um, so uh, anyway, I don't know if, if you're familiar with STIFF, uh, I should explain right up front, because um, people, people may be wondering, you know, what is Mary Roach, maggot queen, uh, <laughs> doing in the afterlife? And it is sort of a, a strange uh, subject area for me to be in. I don't read n New Age books. I don't really read spirituality books. Um, uh, but I do, I do find that this material, this research, is some of the most fascinating, surreal material that an author could find. And it's, it's great fun, and it just seems like such a waste that nobody ever did anything fun with it. Uh, the, the New Age kind of hijacked the subject area, and I am taking it back. Um, and as an example, I'm going to uh, read to you my, uh, I'm going to read a section from the book 
which is a description of a study that was done by the Society for Psychical Research, which is a venerable old group that is still exists and they are headquartered in England. And uh, their membership roster, by pure coincidence, I found, uh, has included at one time or another a Mrs. H.G. Nutter, a Mr. Harry Wack, and a Mrs. Roy Batty. <laughs> Purely by coincidence. Okay. <clears throat> this, uh, I'm not going to give you a description of the context of this. Just believe me when I tell you that there's a reason that I was interested in this research. It's, uh, it would take too long to explain why I'm interested in this. <clears throat> Is it possible to dress up like a ghost and fool someone into thinking he has seen the real deal? Happily, there is published research to answer this question. Research carried out. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I think I did that. <laughs> what, what do I need to touch? Oh. <laughs> this is perfect. I love the, I love it. <laughs> what else can I push? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> is there a theremin music key that I could push? <clears throat> um, okay, research carried out at no lesser institution than Cambridge University. For six nights in the summer of 1959, members of the Cambridge University Society for Research in Parapsychology took turns dressing up in a white muslin sheet and walking around in a well-traversed field behind King's College campus. Occasionally, they would raise their arms, as ghosts will do. <laughs> Other members of the team hid in the bushes to observe the reactions of passers-by. Although some 80 people were judged to have been in a position to see the figure, not one reacted or even gave it a second glance. The researchers found this surprising, especially given that a small herd of cows that grazed the field did, unlike the pedestrians, show considerable interest such that two or three at a time would follow along behind the ghost. <laughs> to my acute disappointment, the study, published in the September 1959 Journal of the Society for Psychical Research, includes no photographs. Several months later, the researchers revised their experiment, changing the venue and adding low moans and on occasion phosphorescent paint. One trial was set in a graveyard right off a main road and clearly in the sight line of drivers in both directions. But again, not a single person of the hundred plus who saw the figure thought it was a ghost, including two students from India. And they have a quote in the study. Although we are superstitious in our country, the men told one of the researchers, we could see his legs and feet and knew it was a man dressed up in some white garment. In their final effort, the research team abandoned traditional ghost appropriate settings and moved the experiment into a movie theater that was screening an X-rated film. <laughs> the author of the paper explains that the X-rating was chosen to ensure no children were traumatized by the ghost. As though that somehow explains the choice of a porn theater as a setting for a ghost experiment. This time, the ghost walked slowly across the screen during a trailer. I didn't know they had trailers at, at porn theaters. I don't know. I guess it's England. I don't know. Maybe it's different. The phosphorescence was not used this time, and presumably low moans were deemed redundant. <laughs> no mention is made of the specific images showing on the screen behind the ghost, but clearly they were a good deal more interesting. The audience was polled after the film, and 46% of them didn't notice the man in the sheet. <laughs> Among those who did, not one <clears throat> thought he had seen a ghost. One man said he had seen a polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> this is an, a real peer-reviewed published study. So uh, anyway, um, I just wanted to give you a flavor for uh, of <clears throat> the sorts of things I came across. <clears throat> 
and why I felt it would be fun to dive into this subject area that um, otherwise I, I, I have spent very little time as a journalist. <clears throat> it's really more of a book. It's not a book about spirits. It's more a book about, <coughs> excuse me, the human spirit. Um, it's a book about all these people, brave, eccentric, inspired, occasionally <coughs> nuts people, who've just taken it upon themselves to find out yes or no, is there a soul, is there an afterlife? And the inspiration for the book was um, a gentleman named Duncan McDougall, who I first came across in Stiff, the cadaver book. This was a <clears throat> gentleman who, he was a regular doctor, Haverhill, Massachusetts, and he just got it into his head that it would be uh, one way to prove that there's a soul is to install dying patients on a very large bed scale and uh, look at the scale when they die to see if the needle went down and when their soul left, which is sort of a naive but charming idea. And he, he did, did this, and he spent some uh, time <clears throat> weighing dogs as well. And then I came across actually four other soul weighers with different variations on a theme. But uh, So there's a whole chapter on soul weighers. And I just got kind of caught up in the idea that American can-do spirit of it just, you know, let's take scientific method and apply it anywhere and solve any mystery we can. Uh, so that was well, some of the other uh, cast of characters. Um, this I love this, the Times reviewer referred to my book as This American Afterlife, <laughs> 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 which is fairly apt, I thought. Um, let's see who else we've got. Well, some of the, I went to some of some universities. University of Virginia is doing kind of a uh, an interesting near-death experience project with a team of cardiologists involved and a computer up near the ceiling. Um, I, if anyone's interested, I can tell you about it later. But uh, And I went down to the University of Virginia where um, Gary Schwartz actually gets an NIH grant to study things like mediums, and uh, uh, it's kind of amazing. He's got a large NIH grant. Uh, I think he's doing some healing work. I think it's that alternative medicine branch of the NIH. That's where he gets his funding. Um, but I, I spent some time there. Uh, uh, some of the my favorite characters in the book are some of the freelancers, though, the people who, who came up with their own you know, backyard plan. There was a guy named uh, Dr. Robert Thewlis, who <clears throat> he was an encryption expert. And Dr. Thewlis encrypted a, a message uh, in, in an unbreakable code, as you apparently, and he had other, he had one other guy look at it, who, and it, in fact, it was supposedly a, an unbreakable code. And the idea would be that Dr. Thewlis would hold the key to the code in his head, and he would take it to his grave, or rather to the beyond, and then all these people he had told about his project would then consult with mediums, who would then contact Dr. Thewlis in the beyond, get the key to the, crack the code, and do so, thus proving life after death. There is, of course, one um, rather glaring problem here, which is the Dr. Thewlis could, of course, have just told a medium beforehand what the key was. But he addressed this in his paper by saying, I happen to be an honest man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, I, I don't know how many mediums were employed, but they ended up with about 100. The University of Virginia took this project over after Dr. Thewlis died and organized all the efforts coordinated the efforts to use mediums to contact Dr. Thewlis, and they tried about 100 uh, keys to solve the code, which uh, amounted to, quote, a meaningless jumble of letters. However, one medium insisted she had contacted Dr. Thewlis no less than eight times, but unfortunately, Dr. Thewlis has forgotten the key. <laughs> uh, so who else, do, who else do we have in the book? We've got... <coughs> Uh, oops, I'm going to mess with the lights again. Uh, uh, there's a whole chapter on ectoplasm, which it was, ectoplasm was in the 1920s and before when spiritualism was really in its um, heyday and there were seances and tables tipping and accordions flying across the room and, and uh, several quite respectable PhDs and Nobel laureates buying into the whole idea. Uh, ectoplasm was, there were a few mediums who basically spit up <laughs> this stuff that was thought to be uh, the physical manifestation of spirit energy and uh, turned out to be um, most often cheesecloth and occasionally sheep guts. But the, uh, it was a fascinating period of time just because it was, there were these men of science who were very, very caught up in it. 
And I think, well, part of it had to do with it being right after World War I and just about everyone had lost a son or two and had a real need, I think, to believe in the afterlife. Um, also, it was, this was following on the heels of the wireless telegraph, the telephone, electricity even, which all kind of, I th think, was bewildering to people. And they were being asked to believe that little, you know, voices could travel across the country. So why not uh, believe that a medium could act as a receiver for a, mess for a voice coming from the beyond? So I guess in that context, it seems a little less batty. But uh, it was very entertaining stuff. Uh, Helen Duncan is one of the mediums that I talk about a lot. She was a um, huge woman, uh, smoked constantly, would swoon often in the course of being possessed by the spirits, occasionally wet herself, uh, <laughs> and would regurgitate her, her ectoplasm. She, because they would search the mediums before the seance to make sure they weren't fraudulently bringing it up their sleeve. And these guys went to great lengths, these experimenters who were trying to understand the phenomenon. They would search her and, and uh, couldn't figure out what, how she was doing it. And, Turned out she was, she was a talented regurgitator. She could on command, I mean, just at will bring stuff up. At one point, they made her swallow a dye, uh, methylene blue dye, so that if she had swallowed anything, it would be seen on the cloth. So that particular night, she didn't bring up any ectoplasm. She didn't bring up any cloth. She tried to pass off her tongue as the ectoplasm. So that was kind of toward the end of Helen Duncan's career. Um, so anyway, I'm particularly fond of the ectoplasm chapter. Uh, we also have uh, Homer Clyde Snook, who didn't really do anything all that spectacular. I just liked saying his name. <laughs> Homer Clyde Snook was involved in a project to x-ray the soul when x-rays first were developed. Of course, every new technology that came out, people thought, you know, whether it was the telephone or, or x-ray, um, uh, that people believed that this would be the thing that would capture spirits. Uh, and even today, some of the ghost hunting groups have, you know, infrared and digital cameras are thought to be the, this will this new this will be the new thing that'll give us the evidence. Yes, right, yeah. Um, the other person I spent some time with was a reincarnation researcher in in uh, India, and he was a lovely man, Dr. Kirti Rawat. Uh, he was in his 60s. Uh, we spent a week together, and it was kind of a, uh, like a, a bad arranged marriage. <laughs> we were, uh, he's a lovely man, but um, I think we just spent a little too much time together. He was, but he, he was, uh, he's interesting because he's, he's a researcher, but he's also a philosopher and a poet. And I remember this, the first day when I got there, it was late at night. We were in a taxi in New Delhi, and it was hot and d dirty, and I was tired. And he leaned over, and he said, are you in a mood to hear one of my poems? <laughs> I really wasn't in it, but I'd listen to it anyway. And it was very, it was a very nice, what? Kirti Rawat, R-A-W-A-T. Kirti, K-I-R-T-I. Yeah, yeah, I'm probably saying it wrong, Kirti. Anyway, so I thought I'd read a little seg a section from that chapter, uh, which is when I've just, we're just <coughs> heading out on our first day, leaving New Delhi and uh, have just left a big traffic jam. And I'm reading this because this was the closest I came to really figuring out if reincarnation happens, because uh, I was nearly uh, killed in <laughs> the traffic. <clears throat> the traffic jam has dissolved, leaving our driver free to proceed. Oh, wait, I should say. Uh, I, I'm going to be uh, attempting an Indian accent here, so p please excuse me, those of you who are in a, in a position to, uh, to uh, know that my accent really sucks. <laughs> okay. The traffic jam has dissolved, leaving our driver free to proceed in the manner he enjoys. This entails driving as fast as possible until the rear, of, rear end of the car in front is practically in his mouth, and then laying on the horn until the car pulls into the other lane. If the other car won't move over, he veers into the path of oncoming traffic and then back at the last possible instant. Livestock and crater-sized potholes materialize out of nowhere, prompting sudden James Bond-style swervings and breakings. It's like living inside a video game. <laughs> Why doesn't he just get into the fast lane and stay there? This is me talking. This is how I talk in real life. <laughs> uh, there isn't a fast lane as such, says Dr. Rawat. He gazes calmly out his window as goats and a billboard for Relaxo footwear flash past. 
The lanes are both the same. Whoever is slower pulls over. He speaks in a neutral narrative tone as though describing a safe and civilized code of the road. Aggressive honking and light flashing is considered good manners. You're simply alerting the driver ahead of your presence. Rearview mirrors are apparently for checking your hairdo. <laughs> Exhortations to blow horn please and use dipper are painted on the backs of trucks so that even the most laid back driver goes along honking and flashing his lights like his team has just won the World Cup. I am finding it hard to relax, oh. <laughs> <laughs> In India, everywhere you look, people are calmly comporting themselves that we in the States would consider a terrible risk, a beseeching of death with signal flare and megaphone. Women in saris perch side saddle unhelmeted on the backs of freeway fast Vespas. Passengers sit atop truck cabs and hang off the sides like those acrobat troops that pile onto a single bicycle. Trucks overladen with bulbous muffin top <laughs> loads threaten to topple and bury nearby motorists under illegal tonnages of cauliflower and potatoes. Accident-prone area, the sign says, as though the area itself were somehow responsible for the carnage. <laughs> People don't seem to approach life with the same terrified, risk-aversive tenacity that we do. I'm beginning to understand why, religious doctrine aside, the concept of reincarnation might be so popular here. <laughs> Rural India seems like a place where life is taken away too easily. Accidents, childhood diseases, poverty. If you'll be back for another go, why get too worked up about the leaving? A bus blasts its horn and bullies us onto the shoulder. And here I have an expletive, which I'm not going to scream out to you. Uh, to which, that's me, <clears throat> to which Dr. Rawat replies, Mary, just don't look out that side. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, now I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to tell you a little ghost story, because it is sort of almost Halloween. This, this was something that he was in Spook, but didn't make the final cut. It's kind of, this is the, like the bonus material on the, on the DVD. Uh, so um, anyway, it's about 10, 12 years ago, I was living in a flat on Russian Hill with a man named David. And one morning I came into the kitchen and on the table was one of those little Valentine's Day hearts with a little message on it. It said, no use which is when you think about kind of a downer for a Valentine's Day message. Probably they've discontinued that heart uh, by now. But anyway, it said no use. And I thought, well, I didn't put that there. And the bowl of candy was way off to the end of the table. And I thought, that's peculiar. And David hadn't put it there. He thought it was strange. And, and at the time, our upstairs neighbors had been rattling on about, oh, we have a ghost because the doors will open and close. And we hear the floors creaking. And I thought, oh. It's the ghost of Mrs. Bassuino. She must have put it there. And I kind of just, just in that way that you believe and don't believe, I thought, oh, okay, it was the ghost. And then I didn't give it much more thought until I was working on Spook. And I thought, well, maybe I could work in some personal anecdotes. And I thought, how could I use this? And it suddenly came to me in a flash that, duh, David had put the heart on the table as a quiet comment on our relationship, which had crashed and burned several months later, and he had moved out. But at the time, I think I was, uh, I was unable to even entertain that possibility because I didn't want to think through the consequences of what that meant if my live-in boyfriend was putting hearts on a table that said, no use. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I became uh, uh, convinced that you know, we had a ghost. And I think it's kind, of a, um, it's kind of an illustrative thing. I think people become, can become very invested in their beliefs and convictions and not quite realize why at the time and not until uh, there's some hindsight on the matter. Um, like I was talking about with the, uh, some of the spiritualists from the 1920s, some of the scientists involved in that, I think, really did want to believe. Um, the postscript, interestingly, is that I tracked down David. He lives in Germany now with his wife and new child, although he said he never wanted to have children. That's beside the point. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I sent him an email. Uh, and I said, OK, I need to know, you know, how are you and all the preliminaries. And I said, I need to know. I'm writing this book, and I, 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 I'm not, I won't be angry. I don't care. It was 12 years ago. Did you put that heart on the table in the kitchen? That's, remember the heart that said no use? And he wrote back, no, he absolutely did not put the heart on the table. So who knows? <clears throat> um, and uh, to this day, I have no idea what happened. 
the other bonus material, my last bonus material before, before closing here, um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about um, the, the title of this book was the subject of protracted and, and very stressful debate between myself and the publisher. And at one point, I actually printed out some of the emails that went back and forth about the name of this book, which I thought I would share with you because they're kind of entertaining, although at the time, they were the farthest thing from entertaining. <clears throat> they were, uh, I think, trying to appeal to a broader audience than my books usually appeal to. And I was, of course, trying to be my usual quirky dingbat self with the title. Okay, October 8th. Oops, there I go with the lights. There we go. Mary, I talked, this is between my editor Jill and myself. This, is, this one is uh, from Jill. Mary, I talked to Bill and Jeannie about soul in a beaker. <laughs> they didn't care for it. October 12th, dear Jill, Ghostbusters sounds like a cheesy Discovery Channel special. October 15th, Mary, none of these titles are working for us. I would send a long list of titles, possible titles. None of these titles are working for us. In particular, Men Aloft sounds like a history of aviation. <laughs> October 18th, Jill, not sure about do you know where your soul is. <laughs> I'll do some more brainstorming. October 21st, Jill, I've got it. Ectoplasm on my pocket protector. <laughs> Uh, October 22nd, no reply. <laughs> November 25th, Mary, maybe it is best to keep it simple. How about the soul? Oh. November 26th, no reply. December 3rd, Mary, do you really want to call your book Goose Pimples? <laughs> anyway, so that's the end of the bonus material, and I'm happy to take questions from uh, anybody about anything in both of the books, either of the books? Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, Thank you. I have two yeah. because of your last answer. So when I was talking to people about this book, almost everybody said, is it about the CIA? <laughs> yeah, that's the, yes, that's the, uh, that was actually not the real concern. The concern was, had to do with that Philip Roth book, The Human Stain in which uh, a professor gets fired for using, for saying, calling a student a spook. He actually thought you know, she wasn't in the room, and so it's sort of a, it's a kind of a comment on PC-ness. But anyway, they, that was what the concern was. That, I don't, uh, they didn't even mention the, the CIA thing, but that was another, yeah. My actual question is whether in all of your research you actually made any change in any of your opinions or beliefs about any of this stuff. Um, I, I did actually change a little bit. I don't want to, I don't want to, tell where I end up because the book is sort of a kind of a person it's a little bit of a personal journey and I don't want to give away the um, give away the end but uh, I did I did I did I, I think I ended up more open to uh, a possibility that there's something we haven't figured out rather than any particular um, afterlife vision that anybody's put forward so yeah a little a little bit more yeah yeah the perceptions of afterlife. Have you seen anything that the internet is changing? Uh, you know, there are. You know, someone mentioned EVP, electronic voice phenomena. Well, there are there are uh, folks who have gotten who believe that there there are ghosts communicating through their an telephone answering machine, their television, their VCR, every technology. There is actually a story in the book about. Um, a man who came to believe that um, a dead woman named Lady Prudentia was communicating with him via his spell checker. And, <laughs> because, and this is a great story because the SPR, you know, those folks, the Society for Psychical Research, they came in and they actually hired an IT professional. And uh, it turned out that what was going on with this, it was that this guy was, because he believed Lady Prudentia was trying to talk to him, he seeded his custom, and, and that it happened when he, when he used his custom dictionary, you know, when it was a proper noun, uh, he seeded his, his custom dictionary with hundreds of words, and he created this uh, bizarre bug that would happen on, like, the 21st misspelling, blah, blah, blah. It's in the book, but um, I just lo I loved that. The, um, oh, and the, and the upshot was that the, the folks at the SPR found the IT woman's explanation a little far-fetched. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, that that's on page two hundred nine. Yeah. Probably not this minute, but um, since it's, it's EVP steps right into what I work on, which is hearing perception. Offline, I can actually explain to you why people think they hear things. I mean, yeah. Simple mechanism having to do with the way the ear works. Yeah. Makes anything you hear is going to get basically abstracted into forms and into voice. If you try hard enough. Yes, yes. It doesn't have to be anything there, right? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, there was a, a wonderful book, um, oh, uh, David Ellis, about who spent a year on a Cambridge fellowship, you know, taking EVP seriously, you know, and trying to, uh, you know, see if there was anything to it. But that's sort of. Anyone that said around by four and, you know, on October 22nd, you know. It what? But it starts giving you betting hints. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, there are, and there are, there are experiments where people have, if you just give somebody non, you know, white noise and you say, this was a lecture that we recorded and we can't really make out the words, could you help us? People will hear all sorts of things in the white noise. Yeah. Yes? Have you worked with Dr. Stevenson? Uh, doctor, no, Dr. Rawat was someone who worked with Dr. Stevenson. I didn't, Dr. Stevenson is quite elderly now. And uh, he wasn't going out on the road, so no, I didn't. I did not work with him. Do you know him? Uh, no. no. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm aware of some of his books. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He. Yes. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Uh, so, what was your opinion of uh, what Doctor Rawat said? Well, the case that Doctor Rawat and I looked into, he was not a strong case. Uh, so that particular case, he agreed that. Um, the, what, well, what happens with a lot of these cases is that the, when, of, when a child starts talking about uh, things that don't fit his life, the parents um, immediately assume, oh, this is, this is a past life, and it becomes kind of excite. And there's a lot of excitement in the village to figure out who is the ch the boy, the reincarnation of, and the, and the word spreads quickly to the neighboring villages. You know, did anyone die around the time that the boy was born? And it's kind of you know going around with a Cinderella slipper, trying to find, uh, and and because there's so much. A, excitement and people like for this to happen. Sometimes I think, in this case, it seemed that um, the stories were not matching up so well and that it was a little bit, unfortunately, people don't write so the stuff down right when the child says it. So it's all, it's kind of working backwards from memory. So this wasn't a particularly good case, no. Anybody else have a, yeah? Is there any cases that do seem to match? There, well, there are, there have been cases in, I, I haven't been, out on the road and seen any. There are some that, they're usually it's a combination of some very striking things that fit combined with a variety of things that, that don't fit. I've never seen a case where everything, you know, matched up exactly. But there are, there are cases where, you know, there'll be a, a the other thing that's difficult with, with rural uh, villages in India is that there's a lot of similarity. In the, you know, somebody says the, the, the house had two rooms. There was a shrine down the street. Um, he owned a car and a, two dogs. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, there's a sameness to the village life, so it's difficult. So you want those really specific details, which unfortunately don't come up that often. But if you read the Dr. Stevenson's case books, I mean, the, the, there are cases that are, uh, you know, kind of, kind of surprising in the specificity of some of the details, not all of them. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. But yeah, yeah. Of your research, did you ever run across anything personally that that you felt that that didn't fit any scientific explanations, or that you know kind of gave you the willies, or anything? Well, I um, I have had I had a moment with I went to the University of Arizona where Gary Schwartz was putting some mediums through their paces, and and there was a woman there, Allison Dubois, who she's the woman in medium, she's the medium in medium, the TV show medium. Oh, anyway. Well, anyways, it's, I, I've never seen the show either, but it's a fairly uh, popular show these days. She uh, did come up with one, uh, a couple of things that were uh, very, very specific. But for me, well, I'll tell you what it was. Um, she had done a sort of an impromptu reading because uh, she said she was getting material from my mother, who is dead. But uh, so she, she, she went through and she went into her little trance thing. She kind of scribbles back and forth on a piece of paper. She doesn't do it, you know. She doesn't do the typical medium thing. And she said a lot of things to me that were uh, either inaccurate or, or quite general. But then afterwards, when I had walked away and was talking to uh, the researcher, she said, 
I'm getting an hourglass, the kind that you turn over, does your brother have one? And my brother actually collects hourglasses. So that was kind of a weird thing. And I thought, well, that's pretty specific. But then I immediately went into, <laughs> I, uh, I, I immediately started thinking, well, if this is my mother talking to me, why are we talking about my brother? Why is it always about my brother? <laughs> why? <laughs> why can't we just focus on me for once? So I kind of got ca caught up in the whole sibling rivalry thing, and, and the, the, the moment, the magic of the moment sort of passed. But that was very specific, and I'm, you know, no one knows my brother collects. They're often, they're in a closet somewhere. It's not a big part of his life, but. So that was a little, woo, but yeah. Uh, but, and I, I so would have loved to have one of, uh, you know, the classic seeing a ghost moment. I would have, that would have been, I'm, I'm very jealous of people who have these uh, paranormal experiences. I would, I would love to. I think maybe my brain's just not tuned the right way. I don't know. So, anybody else? Okay, well, thank you. Oh, yeah, one more. Yeah, yeah. Any types of skeptic movement? Because your research seems to do a lot of stuff that they do. Yeah. In terms of researching and trying to debunk or prove or disprove any kind of phenomena. Yeah. What was the beginning of the question? Any, do you have any ties to oh. movement? Or no, I don't have any ties to uh, PSYCOP is the main one, Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. They need a shorter title. Uh, um, I was, I, I, for in a couple, <coughs> a couple of instances, I relied on papers that they had done and they want me to come and talk down there, uh, but I don't have any formal ties with them, no. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>